Uh, hi, also, um, I'm Kelvin here. We are starting pretty soon in about, let's say, uh, two or three minutes. So before we start, uh, I'm now doing a mic check. Uh, can any can anyone hear me? So if you do, uh, please give a shout out by uh, tapping on you know the uh, go to webinar chat box over there. Yeah, hi all. Can anyone see me or anything like that? Or hear me? Uh, hi, before we start, right, uh, this is a sound check and a screen check, so I would appreciate that uh, those who are in the room already, so just give a shout out to me that you can hear me loud and clear and as well as see my screen, appreciate that. Great, excellent. So, uh, if we are ado, uh, we will start about one minute time because we have much uh, to cover uh, for uh, today because it's one hour. So I hope to uh, share as much as possible as well as highlight those key important charts that I share uh, across the global markets. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kelvin, the market analyst for Singapore. So today's uh, webinar, I'll be covering a very important topic, which is uh, Q1 2022 global markets outlook. And most importantly, uh, how will the US stock market perform, especially when we start to see uh, two weeks ago, since the start of the year, we start to see a dramatic uh, decline in um, most of the US stocks. So uh, we are do, uh, let me... Uh, Show the disclaimer slides first, All right? Okay, so Q&A we will handle towards the end. So uh, do allow me to actually uh, finish the presentation first. Any question, I will be glad to answer towards the end of the presentation. So uh, do feel free to actually keep your questions. Uh, just type it over at the uh, chat. The question box, yeah, in the go in this room, the go to webinar uh, meeting room, yeah. Okay, so uh, whatever I share today in nutshell is uh, not uh, any advice, okay, of uh, anything to buy or sell, all right. It's purely for educational purpose. So over here, this is me. Uh, I'm actually close to about 15 years of experience in the financial markets uh, in the area of research, uh, as well as uh, advisory to. Uh, to hedge funds as well as proprietary trading desk of investment bank and i do have a social media account which i'm in active almost every day where i give up-to-date market commentary uh it, at the start of the asia session and as well as anything interesting that is uh, happening in the market i will actually give a shout out over at my twitter handle so uh, i urge you all uh, to actually if you want to find out what's going on in the market on a day-to-day -day basis you will give me a follow at my twitter handle which is at kelvin sc wong and also today's rec uh, today's uh, quarterly outlook webinar will be recorded in CMC YouTube channel and I will post the recording tomorrow at 
uh, my uh, Twitter social media page as well. Right. Okay, so now good to go. So the first team that I share with you all is uh, Q1 2022 Global Market Outlook team is speculation risk has increased significantly. So what speculation risk is actually, we're now seeing peak growth, higher commodity prices, together with global supply chain management. On top of that, we start to see higher long data strong bond yields, which led, which will eventually lead to higher cost of funding for everyone, including ourselves and our well businesses. So all this will be see the, 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 the risk of speculation is indeed, uh, we call it increase at this juncture. So some key indicators to actually tell us that uh, we are in this stage of potential speculation is we start to see flash PMI data. So this is the latest PMI data that was released on this Monday by uh, IHS uh, Market, which is actually the uh, global uh, compiler of PMI across purchase, purchaser manager survey. They actually they survey the manufacturing and the service sector. So this flash PMI, they put it together. So they has indicated a slowdown in developed nations growth. The lowest so far since June 2020, you will see the dramatic fall in terms of output and as well as new orders. All right, so anything hitting the below, the 50 line below is actually contraction rather than expansion. So what we could see for C over here is that the initial uh, uh, lift off or the, the V-shaped recovery uh, post-pandemic has started to erase dramatically. So this is a clear indication of a, a, a potential deceleration of growth. And if you look at confidence, uh, as based on the U.S. consumer, because you look at U.S. consumer is actually the, in terms of they has a sway in, uh, in, in a say on global economic growth. Why? Because if you look at U.S. itself tends to consume uh, in terms of uh, global services as well as manufacturing goods globally. So that's why U.S. consumer is kind of the king to uh, to global economic growth. Uh, it still persists uh, since uh, 10 years ago and it still today. Is still intact today. So U.S. consumer confidence as measured by the University Minister of Consumer Sentiment data. So the latest one they have in Jan 2020 released about uh, two weeks ago or so. Preliminary is at 68.8, which is actually the second lowest level in a decade. So can you see the short deceleration of growth of slowdown in consumer sentiment since April 2021? All right. Then coupled with consumer set, U.S. consumer sentiment is weak. Global PMI data is weak. And we top up with inflation. If you look at U.S. inflationary rate accelerated to 7% in January this year, which is actually uh, close to 40-year high. And it actually surpassed the previous peak of 5.6% before the uh, recession took hold. Right, so that was actually in Ju July 2008. Okay, so this recession was actually uh, kind of uh, reinforced by Lehman Brothers crisis as well. So it really surpassed the previous peak, okay, the previous peak that they actually saw that uh, July, that, that 2008 recession, which is 5.6%. So what we could see over here is that this level of recession, this level of inflation was actually not seen close to about a decade ago. So everyone was actually accustomed to actually very low inflationary numbers since the last 10 years, and it just spiked up. Huh? So this is like a bullish breakout, huh? a shock to the US economy and as well as the global economy. And if you to look at certain, okay, as well as sometimes some inflationary uh, data, some inflationary component might be trans, might be temporary, but sticky inflation. So uh, inflation that persists. So this is actually come up by the um, the, the, the uh, Cleveland uh, Federal Reserve. They actually come up with this sticky inflation index. So this U.S. If sticky inflation, the latest data actually rose to 3.5% in December, which is also the highest level since August 2008. Okay, and so surpassed the previous uh, peak that was recorded during the prior recession, which is in 2008, which is at 3.08%. It surpassed the peak as well. So what it means that over here is that sticky inflation, the sticky component, also rose significantly as well. All right. Then on top of this, the most important part will be to combat or to contain inflationary pressure. What the, uh, the the global central bankers or the U.S. Fed could do is to hike rates. Okay, but the problem with the hike in rates will actually lead to a further rise in the U.S. Treasury yield from the short end to the long end as well. 
So if you look at the long, the longer end, the longer term, pardon me, the 10-year treasury yield, which is considered as a global benchmark for cost of funding in terms of your mortgage loan or your corporate loans, as well as uh, personal loans. It's been steadily been increasing since the 0.33% level that was hit in March 2020. So right now, uh, based on the data of last week or last Friday, it's at 1.76%. The key level to watch will be this 2.55%. So what this 2.55% is in fact the upper boundary of this long-term descending channel since 1987. So we're talking about close to more than uh, 30 over years of downtrend, circular downtrend. A break above 2.5% will actually unleash a bullish breakout in US Treasury yield. So that could actually end that 30 over years of downtrend to kickstart a major uptrend. So what it means, it could actually lead to higher cost of funding globally. All right, something to be mindful of, to watch for. And the next key thing is, yes, we start to see inflation number going up. We also start to see a uh, yield, tenure going up. But however, growth is slowing. Okay, growth is slowing. How? by an indication of this uh, 10 year and 10 year minus two year spread and the US Treasury at 30 year minus five year spread. And every time prior to the a recession take shape, this was in 2008, this two curve actually, the yield spread, the, the yield spread of this two actually slowed downwards first. All right, similar to the dot-com bubble recession in 2000, it slowed downwards first. And as well as during the 19, uh, 1990s, it's, it actually slowed downwards first. And watch most closely over here is the, the 10 year and two year actually inverse to go below zero. So this actually took shape, right? This is a small little recession during the pandemic. Okay, so prior to the pandemic, so around March, it actually declined close to zero before rebounding. And right now it's actually decelerating on the downside again for both the, the 10 year minus two year spread and the 30 year minus five year spread. All right. And what's interesting over here is the liquidity condition starts to tighten as well. So if this inching upwards, is tightening, it's inching downwards, it's loosening. Okay. So this measure by the uh, Chicago Fed, uh, Federal Reserve, it came out with the liquidity condition index. So let me share with you, if I were to zoom in over here, you could see since, oops, let me turn off my webcam again. So since June 2021 low, it has been shaping a series of higher high and yellow to see over here so what you could see is that the liquidity condition uh they, they call it the nfci index as as uh, created by the uh, chicago uh, federal reserve has indeed tightened over the last couple of months which is the last six months or seven months or so so with growth slowing and liquidity condition tightening over here it's actually a toxic mixture a toxic mix of slow growth high inflation but liquidity condition not there to support this asset okay so now with that in mind right we could start to see this uh this one I'll take a bit of time this one measures right uh what i did is that i i thought the s&p 500 which is actually uh one of the oldest stock market in the world has historical data since 1955 1955 and the spread uh between the s&p divided by the bloomberg commodity index over here okay this is the spread huh? So this is the blue line is the Bloomberg Commodity Index. So what I'm doing this spread over here is just think about it. If this spread is increasing, it means that the S&P is outperforming commodity prices. That means, i.e., profit growth, U.S. corporation profit growth is higher than the commodity prices. That means, i.e., uh, corporations are able to increase the price of their goods and services. But if commodity prices if this spread starts to decline, it means that commodity prices is increasing much faster than the performance of the S&P 500. That means IE profit growth start to decline over here. And what's interesting over here is that every 40% decline, we talk about a, a major correction in the S&P was preceded by a negative divergence since in the, seen in the ratio of this S&P slash Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is what it means over here. Over here, the ratio. So before the SP actually shaped this 40% corrective down move in the last, uh, uh, in this nine, December 72 to August 74 major correction, there's a negative divergence that's being seen on the ratio of the SP and the Bloom, uh, slash 
Yumba Commodity Index. Even though the S&P shape higher high, but the ratio shape lower high. That means this represents a deceleration of performance in the S&P over the Commodity Index. Okay. Similar during the August 2000 period, which is the Combago, and September 2002, when the market slide negative 40.5%, there's divergence as well, negative divergence. During the Lehman Brothers crisis, August 2007 to February 2009, 40, negative 47%, there's a divergence that's been formed as well. And what's interesting over here is that another negative divergence has been formed while prices going to go up higher. So the next key thing over here is, do you notice, we notice that yes, even though divergence is being formed, prices can continue to push higher on the S&P. So we need to investigate what is the lead time when the divergence is being formed while the S&P going to push up higher timing. So what I mean by this is this, let's go on to the next slide over here. This is what I call the lead time. That means I need to know what's the lead time in the prior correction of S&P up move before picking after the negative divergence has been seen on the ratio of the S&P 500 slash Bloomberg commodity index. All right. So what we could see over here is that right over here. There's this divergence that's being formed at this point in time from April 1971 to December 1972. Pick up. So there is actually a 20 months lead period over here before the S&P actually collapsed by 40 over percent in December 72 all the way to August 74. So there's this lead period of, of 20 months. All right. So during this collapse of the dot-com bubble, as you all could see here, the prices go up higher. The divergence that's being formed on the ratio, the lead period is 14 months. All right. Over here, the lead period during the Lehman product crisis is nine months from Jan 2007 to October 2007. All right. So now let's investigate what is the lead period over here. So you could see over here is that the, now the price is moving. So this is based on 19 of Jan data, 19 of Jan this year. Prices going to go up, means the ICP going to go up. However, the divergence has really started to form much earlier. All right. During November 2002 to March 2021, there's this divergence are lower high. That means this is the first lower high is being formed. So if I were to take from March, from since this been this divergence been detected on, on from November 2002 to March 2002, so we will just start counting a lead period from April 2021 all the way down to Jan 2022. All right. So far, 10 months. So we have a period of leap year of 10 months uh, so far. So if I were to base on the median, the median of the prior leap periods of the previous, you know, the prior to the previous last three, 40% uh, corrective decline, we have 14 months. It's a, it's a median period of 14 months. Uh. So right now we have 10 months so far. So all in all, right, if I were to put this difference, we have four more months to go. Uh. That means what it means over here is that the approximate potential circular peak for the S&P right now is Jan plus by the difference of the median, median of the prior lead period and what we see so far in 10 months, which is four months, it gives us around May 2020 or it could be slightly earlier. All right. So what it means that over here is that we are actually based on technicals uh, of the spread that I analyzed earlier on of the S&P versus Bloomberg Commodity Index and the S&P prices, we may be approaching a, a circular pick up on the S&P, okay, supported by this uh, 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 increased risk of uh, stagflation that is coming into the marketplace. All right. Now, so this one team can be mindful of. Then the next team is over here that this monetary policy divergence between US and China that is taking shape right now in Q1 2020. As you know that today, later will be the FOMC meeting. So very high likelihood. They will not cut today, but they will actually signal their move to come in in March. All right. So, uh, but however, in China, if you look at China recently, they just reduced 
their borrowing costs on their various benchmark interest rate. All right. So I, I don't I do not want to actually elaborate further on that. You can actually uh, search on the net. Everything you could find on there. So we start to see two two sides of the story: U.S. hiking rates, China reducing rates. So how does it impact the global stock market? Okay. So this is the impact I like to share with you. All. So if you look at the performance, right, as of last Friday, as you know, that last Friday the U.S. market did a dramatic fall. So Currently, right, based on year-to-date performance, I mean, two all year-to-date, well, if you could see over here, this is how the S&P performed at the bottom of the table, negative 8.2%, 8.3% based on performance as of last Friday. And definitely, if you look at uh, if you look at the car price, it's much lower. But what's surprising over here that is residing in positive territory is related to all China-related stock market, the Hang Seng Index. Singapore index, the Straits Times, surprisingly at positive 5% based on last Friday prices. The iShares China Large Cap Index with the ticker called FXX, this is listed in the New York Stock Exchange. The Hang Seng Tech Index, which is comprised of China Big Tech Stock, plus 4%. The Korean Share CSI China Internet Platform ETF, this is called the KWEB, is listed in the NASDAQ, plus 1%, 1.6%. The one that is negative will be Asia X Japan as a whole. This is the ETF, uh, Japan ETF, called EWJ, and the European ETF, they call the I Euro. Okay, so if you look at over here, is that all of them are actually outperforming the US market. And most surprisingly, the one that is showing positive performance are related to, closely related to China over here. So what we could see over here is that it could be the anticipation of the more rate cuts from China is actually causing a flow of funds into these related markets over here, which actually been, is, has been supported by lower valuation as well. So let's take a look at the valuation. If you look at the valuation over here, we could see that the, as you can, this is based on the data of 20th of Jan. The SPX has a valuation of 24.78 times P ratio. If you look at the Hansing tax, index with comprises of China Big Tech is at 15.54%, which is definitely much more attractive or lower than the SPX. All right. And one interesting thing over here is this data about credit impulse. So based on 21st of Jan 2020, the China Bloomberg Credit Impulse Index, the one in orange. So actually this is basically new credit growth. Think, of, think about a new credit growth formula to be precise is new loans divided by the GDP. All right. So if you look at the, the credit impulse index, it starts to inverse up since the start of this year. And if you look at this China CSI, uh, which is the benchmark China, the benchmark stock market for China of both uh, big cap stock in Shenzhen and the Shanghai Stock Exchange, you could see that the credit impulse index, the one in orange, move hand in hand, almost in similar lockstep with the China, China CSI. Recently, it started to decelerate last year due to the, de the de de leveraging policy that the China top policymakers want, you start to see a, 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 a kind of a slowdown in the China CSI as well. And recently, it starts to pick up again due to the slight turn up in this uh, credit impulse index. Okay. And if you look at this over here, it's much more clear. Hang Seng Tech Index, almost in lockstep, uh, Credit impulse increase during 2015. It went up as well. Hang Seng Tech Index, which, which is considered of China big tech, uh, with the likes of Alibaba, JD.com, and, and, and Tencent. Uh. Decelerate during 2018. Increase again during 2018, 2019. Decelerate, and you start to see a sharp deceleration in the Hang Seng Tech Index as well. And right now, this credit impulse index starts to turn which it means that it may start to have a leading, leading uh, uh, positive impact on the Hang Seng Tech Index going forward. And if you could see uh, Hang Seng Index, very similar as well, uh, the correlation between the China Bloomberg Credit Impulse Index and its previous price movement. All right. And right now it starts to shape a turn as well that it could have a leading, uh, positive leading implication potentially towards the Hang Seng Index. And if you look at the Asia X Japan, pretty similar as well in the past few occasions. All right. And what's 
interesting over here is that if I were to plot the Bloomberg Credit Impulse Index with the S&P 500, you could see in the past, right, it, it doesn't have any, uh, 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 what you call, uh, strong direct correlation with the movement of the S&P 500. So yeah, even though last year the Credit Impulse Index starts to drop dramatically to a, since uh, early 2021 or late 2020, the S&P continued to march upwards. So what it means that even though if China, the Chancellor Bank starts to reduce interest rate much further this quarter or even the, 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 into the first half of this year, it likely will not have any impact on the S&P 500, all right? Based on the correlation, the past correlation between the uh, Bloomberg China Credit Impulse Index with the uh, S&P, the historical uh, price movement of the S&P, all right? So as you could see that previously, the, the credit impulse uh, decelerated during late 2017, 2016, all the way to early, uh, to its, towards uh, early 2019, the S&P going to march upwards uh, during this period of time. Okay, so no, there's no strong uh, correlation or direct correlation. Okay, now next. So next over here, let's take a look at uh, this, this next theme. Uh. So next, next theme I want to talk about over here is this uh co this this recent sell off since the peak of November 2021 of the US uh the MSCI index ACWI which is 60% in US stock market Bitcoin and Ethereum and as well as US Treasury bond TLT US investment grade and US high yield corporate bond okay notice that all of these instruments one two three as well as the U.S. Uh, fixed income based from treasury all the way to investment grade and as well as high yield bond, all of them actually declined together with the U.S. stock market sell-off, all right? Because 60% uh, of, of this ACWI index, 60% is, is has a weightage in the U.S. stock market, all right? But what's interesting over here is that, that means what, what I mean, what, what I was trying to say over here is that Bitcoin, Ethereum, as well as U.S. fixed fix income does not offer diversification benefits in the recent sell-off seen in the U.S. stock market. That means if U.S. stock market were to continue to sell off further down the road, based on this movement itself over here, Bitcoin, Ethereum, as well as U.S. fixed income, they may not offer that kind of benefits that we want. Okay, but however, benefits, diversification benefits could be seen in WTI crude oil prices. We can keep on continuing. And most interestingly, in gold price, which starts to inch up higher lately. So the diversion benefits could come in instead of oil and gold if the US uh, stock market going to sell off much further. All right. Based on this uh this this team that is actually taking place right now. Okay, so now let's take a look at okay, this is the historical performance or it's a last year uh 2000 annual performance. Okay, so uh, all the sector actually posted double digit gains. Okay, first time in history, all sector posted double digit gains. Okay, so it's a very quickly I'll flash through. Okay, so what's interesting over here is that the six months performance. So what I do what I do I did the spread between the sector, with energy versus the XPX. So you see the top three sectors are the top was actually the energy, semiconductor, and financials. But the rising yield curve uh, starts to rise uh, dramatically. So if I look at the shorter term performance, the three months performance right as of 18 of Jan you start to see outperformance in energy when they outperform. And what's interesting over here is that two defensive consumer stables and utility starts to actually jump up into the leader, leadership board in this period of rising yield curve. The rising U.S. Treasury, a part of it, the 10-year U.S. Treasury has start to rise. So what it means over here is that there could be potential outperformance of energy and defensive in Q1 2022. So the one that is at the bottom of the table is FANGS, uh, as well as biotech company and uh, small caps, as well as com services. So all these are considered as growth related uh, sector of stocks that I believe will actually uh, potentially underperform the, the, the overall market due to this uh, rising uh, US 10 year treasury yield. And now if we were to go into the factors, okay, so as you know that US is also, we can actually look at factors, factors as in high beta, uh, value, high quality, low volatility, momentum, and growth. So based on the last six months, right, you could see 
high beta, right? High beta up performance has starts to decline, uh, slight decline, and break this support line over here in the period of this rising yield curve. Okay, but what's interesting if I will zoom in into a three months period, as of 18 of Jan, you see the top performer instead of being high beta, it's low volatility, value, and high quality factors that are actually outperforming the general market. Where else? The, the high beta momentum and growth are actually underperforming. All right, in in the, in, in this current period, uh, current uh, uh, we call it a uh, uh, period of rising U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. So what it means that all in all over here, we could start to see potential upperformance of low volatility, value, high quality factors, based with uh, high quality factors based U.S. equities in Q1 2022. All right, so with that over here, right, what is the technical outlook of the major stock indices that I'll share with you all? So uh, let's have a quick recap of this performance that what we see uh, so far. This was last year. So last year, we could see uh, almost strong performance in the US stock market. So what is we are seeing right now is the lower, val uh, lower valuation, which is the Hansing Tech and Hansing Tech Index is actually now outperforming the US uh, market. Okay, because of based on last year's low value, low bet, low bet, low performance that lead to a lower valuation. Okay, so but however, if you look at uh, double digit day gains cannot last on forever on the US uh, stock market, right? So now very quickly, uh, let's take a look. Let's recap. Uh, so last quarter Q4, we are expecting a bullish bias on the S&P 500 to see a push up towards uh, 46.30. Then followed by 49.70 slash 90. So, uh, in fact, what what you see over here is has really been met. Uh, 46.30 has been met. So it printed a uh, current all time high. It printed a high of 4809 on 30th of December. Okay. So what's there's a bearish divergence that's being spotted already. Uh, so that is a, a signs of a divergence. So what's interesting over here is that I know that Monday there's this dramatic sell off. So this shot was did uh, did on Friday instead of Monday uh, instead of of Monday, Monday US session. So at the close of the US session on Monday, the price actually tested 4240 uh, and shape now and now just try to shape a bounce off from it over here. So 4240 was actually a, 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 a titan a long term key people that support that I have for the SP 500 that I uh, kind of a uh, had it in a couple of weeks ago already. So those who actually followed my uh, uh, follow my tweet. In my social media channel and as well as in CMC Global Market Outlook, uh, annual outlook, uh, annual report that I, I published towards the end of the year, we did mention 4 to 40 as a key long term pivotal support to watch for the downside trigger. So, as long as this support level holds, right, we still expect the SPX to shape this final push up towards 4090 slash uh, 4090, then maximum 4170 slash 40 before this uh, potential 30% uh, quantitative decline to take shape towards 3720. Uh, there after breaking below, you see 3250. All right. Similar for the SPX as well. Uh, in fact, on Monday it actually hit. Hit to this on Monday. This one was actually last quarter outlook. So 3820 was that out. Uh, was that uh, uh, we call it uh, long term pivotal support. So we're looking for a push up towards uh, 16 16,630 uh, slash 16,830. That so. Uh, Already been met over here. That means the target has been met of 16,630 slash 16,830. Printed a high of 16,768 on 22nd of November. Okay. Then thereafter, it did a dramatic fall uh, to actually test that uh, pivotal support that we have very closely to 13,800. So we tidy up a bit to 13,900. Okay. So previously it was here 10,820. Okay. So it actually hit here and form this uh, potential ongoing weekly bullish hammer candlestick. So we tidy a bit over here, 13,900. So as long as 13,900 holds, we may see a final push up towards 16,660. A break above it may take us up towards 17,590 slash uh, 18,150. So that's the risk level before a potential corrective decline takes shape. Huh? So but however, if this week it has a weekly close below, 13,900, then all this uh, uh, we call it, uh, final push up scenario will be invalidated and we may kick start that 30% uh, corrective decline process to, to, to start to take shape. Okay, towards uh, 12,050, then followed by 10,960. Okay, over here. So, very quickly, right, uh, Dow Jones was neutral uh, last quarter. 
So uh, for this uh, quarter, we actually use uh, 30,000, uh, 33,000, 30, pardon me, 30, 33,300 as the key long-term pivotal uh, support level to look for a final push up as well towards 38,450 maximum 40,000 level before this potential corrective uh, decline takes shape towards 29,600 thereafter by 26,000 level. So definitely the key support level to watch will be at 33,300 for this quarter. So if this level doesn't hold, that means you have a weekly close below 33,300. So uh, this should be LT, uh, long term pivot. Uh, so it's a typo error here. My apologies. So 33,300 is a long term pivotal support. So if you have a weekly close below this level, then uh, the, the last push up scenario will be evaluated. All right. So the, this one over here, we uh, turned, it was neutral for the Russell 2000 index. So uh, if we have a break above the 2367, so this was last quarter outlook, it may take us up the first step towards 2460 then that we did venture earlier on, that a break above should take us higher towards this 2640 slash 2755. So what's interesting over here is that, yeah, it did stage a bullish breakout above 2367, the upper boundary uh, that we have on the last quarter. But what's interesting over here is that where it stopped right, it actually stopped right at 2460, which was the first resistance that we mentioned in last quarter, it printed a high of 2463 on 8th of November. So that was the current all-time high before it shaped another reintegration back below 2367. So this is something like a failure bullish breakout. And we start to see uh, there's no clear positive elements. Elements has been negative. So uh, we are not confident uh, that, that, that this uh, Russell 2000 can shape at another all-time high again. So, uh, in fact, it's the weakest uh, so far, the weakest among the U.S., among the major U.S. stock indices. So, we rather have a neutral stance, again, for this quarter between 2367 and 17,040 slash, pardon me, 1740 slash 1700 level. So, neutral between these two range. So, unless we have a weekly close above 2367, then we could potentially validate another up move towards 2700 level. 2755. All right. So now neutral, uh, remain neutral for the uh, Russell 2000. Okay. Now, next, uh, this is the Hong Kong. So, Hong Kong, right? Uh, previously, we were neutral between 26,770 and 24,000 uh, level. So, what we could see over here is that we start to see a strong bounce so far in this monthly chart of this 23,000 level, which is the key support level. Why is the key support level? It's because it's actually the Long term ascending trend line that kept previous steep decline over here and over here and is in place since a significant event that took shape, which is the October 2008 low. So, whatever your October 2008 is actually this, the, the steep fall triggered by the Lehman Brothers crisis. And the daily, the, week, the monthly RSI is all bouncing off from a key corresponding support level as well, key corresponding ascending support level as well. Okay, then on the weekly, you could see a series of bullish candlestick that's being formed uh, in late December, one, two, three. It tested very, it tested the intraday below 23,000, but refused to actually have a weekly close below it. So this is indeed a key detection level uh, on the Hansing Index, 23,000. So this 20,000 must hold in order for us to shape this uh, potential technical rebound that we are, we may expect this quarter at 26,770 slash 26,880. So definitely this level must hold. You cannot have a weekly close below it. If you have a weekly close below it, this tactical rebound scenario will be invalidated to see a retest to, uh, during the March uh, pandemic swing low area of 21,480. A break below should take us now much lower towards 18,050 level. Okay, so uh, next index quickly, very quickly, our highlight is Japan. So Japan previously, we are just expecting, uh, as long as this 2688 level holds, we are expecting a break up above the previous swing high area that was formed in, 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 in um, September last year uh, to shape higher high, it was 33,520. But however, the prices of the Japan 225 or the 5 refused to break above the February, 2, 2, 2, February 2021 high. And September, it retests that level again, but refused to break and start to shape downwards. And now retesting the, our last quarter key pivotal support. And graphically, what we're seeing right now, it could be an impending double top on Japan 225. And as well as if you look at the daily RSI, it's actually, uh, or not daily, the partly the weekly RSI is not showing any positive element. And in fact, it starts to break below the support level 
And prior to that, it started to shape a series of lower high or a descending resistance that have been drawn. So what is indicating to us that momentum has turned weak on the weekly RSI, which doesn't, uh, we call it, uh, support a, a, a further push up uh, above the February 2021 high. So we rather have a neutral stance for this quarter between 30,716 and 26,880. That means uh, still expecting a sideways range between these this, this two uh, levels over here on the BK225 and the Japan225. So next, all right, will be the Australia 2000. Australia 200 index, pardon me, the ASX 200. So ASX 200, previously, we are just expecting a bounce to take shape, holding above 6850, 6, uh, 6800 long-term paper support level, also above the 50-week MA at that point in time, towards uh, 7,950, all right? But however, recent price action has negate, negated uh, 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 this uh, initially, this initial last quarter bullish bias view. So if you look at the current situation right now is that the price action has starts to break below the 50 week MA and as well as this major descending channel support level. And right now it's actually uh, uh, hitting this, uh, the last no, last previous quarter long term period of support, which is at 6,800 level. But however, the weekly RSI is not doing that well. It's actually breaking below a key support level. Okay, previously it managed to help, help above this pullback support level above the 50%. Now it's actually reintegrated back below it. So what is indicating to us over here is that the momentum has started to turn weak on the ASX 200 as depicted by the uh, bearish observation that's being seen on the weekly RSI. So this led us to be uh, have a more cautious approach on the uh, ASX 200. So we have a neutral stance between uh, 7,660. So this 7,660 was so uh, shape this uh, weekly uh, bearish candlestick that was actually rejected on the previous all-time high level over here, here at this point in time, so at 7660. So neutral between 7660 and 6800 on the ASX 200 for this quarter. Okay, then now uh, for the German, German 30 index or the German DAX we call it. So previously we have uh, this level here, 13,600 level still looking for a, a slow push up towards 6,685, then followed by 17,800 slash uh, 18,120. So that was the last quarter outlook there. So uh, if you look at this quarter, the technical element still remains the same. There's no major changes. So we will still maintain that same uh, bias, but we've got to be careful over here. So perhaps you're also expecting a final push up as well due to this uh, bearish divergence that is being seen on the weekly RSI. Okay, so prices going up higher, but the RSI is not shaping higher high, but instead it's not to say lower high, but it still managed to help above this key support level at the 43% level. So all in all, right, what we see is that we're still watching the 13,600 13, key long-term people support. So as long as this level holds, we may still start to see a final push up towards uh, this 16,685 a maximum uh, at 17,800 slash 18,120. So if this level doesn't hold, then maybe if you have a weekly close below 13,600, then this uh, last push up scenario will be invalidated where we kickstart that uh, potential uh, significant major corrective decline in the first step towards 11,330 for the German uh, tax index. Right, so very quickly for those who are in Singapore, this is the local uh, straight time index that has, has been one of the outperformer in the region so far. So uh, what we could see over here is that overall it's still in a very big sideways triangle market since the all-time high of October 2007, which is 3907. Previously, it was rejected at April 2018 before it did a three years, a close of two years of decline. Okay. Of the pandemic low, and it's just you know, from here it should it bounce again. So what we could see over here is that the monthly RSI still remains positive, holding above the 52% or the 50% level, hasn't hit the overbought region yet. So what we could see is we could see a final push up as well towards the 390 and towards the top of this major uh, range resistance, which is at 3550 slash 3610, as long as uh, 3020. So that is my key long-term pivotal support that I set for this quarter on the STI. So as long as 3020 holds, that means there's no weekly close below it, we can still shape this uh, residual or final push up 
towards the top of this channel at 3550 slash 3610. So unless we have a very clear weekly break above 3610, then we could actually validate a further up move here. So till then, we're taking uh, one step at a time for the SDI index. All right. Now, what's next will be FX market. So very quickly on the FX market, overall, this is the uh, last year performance. So what you could see is that if the line is coming downwards, that means the currency is actually up. Uh, the currency is actually underperforming the US. Sorry, the currency is actually underperforming the USD. That means coming down, that means dollar strength. Huh? So we could see over here is last year, only two currencies that is actually outperforming the US dollar, which is the Chinese yuan, uh, closed, uh, closed 2021 at a positive of 2.21%, and the Canada dollar is outperforming the USD at 0.69% due to a firmer oil prices. So the rest of the uh, currency from the sterling, Singapore dollar, Swiss franc, a New Zealand dollar, Aussie dollar, Euro dollar, and the Japanese yen, all of them are actually underperforming the USD. All right, so this is how we see. So what is actually expected of uh, this quarter over here? So the most interesting, we look at the Chinese yuan over here. So the Chinese yuan has been a, 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 a strong outperformer. So before we go into the Chinese yuan, let's take a look at the uh, broad-based uh, outlook of the US, uh, the US dollar, but we're looking at the US dollar index called the DXY. Uh, which has a high weightage in the euro dollar. So you look at the DXY, right? It has been trading in a long-term circular uptrend since March 2008. All right. So what you could see over here, interestingly, right? Uh, it has been in a kind of a sideways range since its high of 2017, hit the low of 2018. What's interesting over here is that this low correspond to the previous range top of 88.20 before it shaped this bullish breakout, hit the top of the ascending channel. Come back again, push up, can't break above 2017 high, and came back down again to retest very closely 8820, which was the Jan 2021 low. So that was last year's uh, low in January, and now starts to inch higher. All right. So for this quarter, right, as long as 8820 holds, we could still see further potential strength as depicted by the US dollar index to at least retest this uh, range top that is in a range resistance that is in place since Jan 2017, which is at 103.65 level. Unless this level breaks, then we could see further upside right towards the top of this ascending channel and towards this, this bunch of congestion zone over here, which is at 109.30 slash 112.20. But what's interesting over here is that our momentum has really started to shape a bullish breakout, right, as depicted by the Money RSI, which is uh, telling us that uh, upside momentum starts to creep back into the US dollar index. So, but we are still taking that one step at a time. So, still looking for a push up, but at least in first step to a 103.65 hold, as long as this 88.20 key long term pivotal support holds over here. Or if this support breaks, then all bets are off. We start to see a decline back towards this 7890, okay, which is the lower boundary of this ascending channel. Okay, now what's next for the Chinese yen? You know, highlight. So this is US dollar slash CNH. Uh, that means if this line is going up, dollar is strengthening. So what I plotted over here is the yield spread between the US Treasury yield minus the China 10-year bond yield, the government bond yield. So you realize that over here, dollar strengthening against the CNY has been in line with the yield, US yield that is yielding more than the 10-year Chinese bond yield at that point. Uh, and when the dollar starts to weaken against the Chinese yuan, uh, since hitting a peak of May 2020, all the way down to uh, May 2021 low. So in fact, now it's breaking below the May 21 low. It's been supported by this declining yields, US yield spread over the China 10 year yield, right? But what's interesting over here, since 16 of November 2020 low, the yield spread, the discount, that means the discount field now is, is negative. That means US treasury yield is lesser than China 10 year yield. But this discount is this discount right now is solely narrowing due to the differential policy or different policy of the Fed and China PBOC. If was Fed is hiking, China PBOC is reducing rate. So this lead to the the, the, the discount of the, the the yield spread being narrowed. But this discount of the yield spread that's being narrowed right now is not being seen into the US slash CNY rate. Why? Because at this moment in time, right, the yuan is still strengthening. It's due to inflows into other capital asset classes, 
in anticipation of a further cut in rates that could lead to potential capital gain in China bonds as well as China related equities. So we feel right, uh, but longer term, right, we do not see further pot potential uh, downside in the dollar CNH. That means uh, what we see is that as long as 6.5 holds, potentially we could see a final push down to a 6.27 slash 6.20 before the, the, the yuan starts to actually uh, uh before this 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 uh, we call it discount on the u.s treasury yield uh the shrinking uh discount yield spread between the u.s treasury and the china uh, 10 years home bond may start to actually put cap on the yuan strength okay now next will be the gpb so uh this was last quarter we were looking for a push down towards uh 1.327 the break below should take us down to 2730 slash 2490. So the sterling dollar, yes, it indeed shaped a push down, but after that it hit the downside trigger level, it shaped a rebound. So for this quarter, still no change. Why? Because uh, the weekly RSI is still bearish, okay, still, still pretty bearish. So it needs to ask that momentum is still uh, skewed towards the downside. So as long as 1.380, a 1.4380 long term pivotal support is not surpassed. Uh, a break below, uh, a weekly close below 3270 should take us down much lower towards 2730 slash 2490 potentially on the sterling dollar. Okay, then uh, what's next for the euro dollar? So previously, euro dollar, right, we're looking for a push down towards uh, 1.1440 slash uh, one, uh, 1290 level. Okay, so uh, interestingly, this level has really been hit, uh, it's been hit. So for this quarter, we still re remain that bullish, bearish buyers on the euro dollar uh, to tighten the key long-term pivotal resistance to uh, 1.1760 to maintain that bearish bias towards the lower boundary of this uh, major triangle range support that is in place since Jan 2017 low, now at a support level at 1.0880, 1.0815 on the euro dollar, as long as 1.1660, uh, tighten key long-term pivotal support is not surpassed to the upside. Okay, now for the Aussie dollar, uh, previously we have a neutral stance between 80, 75 and 70 cents. So uh, latest technical elements has indicate a uh, weak momentum as well, holding below a key resistance level on the RSI, which is below the 49% level and start to shape a lower high over here. So that being in shape over here, given that the momentum has starts to turn weak, as debated by the R weekly RSI, we actually now have a bearish stance between uh, as long as 76 cents is not surpassed, which is my long term pivotal support. A break below 70 figure uh, it could take us down much lower towards the lower boundary of this uh, descending channel that is, starts to unfold since the high of 25th of uh, February 2021, which is the, the lower bound, the, the support level that is at 65.50 slash 64.60. So as long as 67 holds, a break below 70 cents should take us down potentially towards 66.50 slash 64.60 on the Aussie dollar. Okay, now on the Canada dollar, previously we, we mentioned that this impending top that's been forming over here, we have a neutral bias between 30.20 and 1.2060. So uh, at this moment in time, what we could see over here is that there's very mixed elements. Why? Uh, because we could see that the yield spread between the US 10 year treasury over the Canada dollar has started to narrow. So this narrowing of this uh, yield spread between the U.S. Treasury and Canada government yield uh, may not support further strength in dollar Canada because given the close correlation between the movement of dollar cap and the yield spread between the U.S. Uh, Treasury yield over the, the uh, Canada bond yield, okay, is slightly positive as 0.33%. So, so that could actually add uh, some uh, we call cap on dollar strength against the Canada dollar. And what's interesting over here is that uh, the oil prices are going to be very firm, even much higher. So uh, yeah, even though the, the, over here is that the, 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 the Canada, so what I did, I did the inverse. So I plotted is uh, USD per cap, it means one cap equals to how many USD. So uh, yes, even though uh, oil prices are going to inch higher, you see the Canada dollar uh, starts to weaken slightly. Uh. But however, even though the correlation is still pretty strong in terms of the, the 20 uh, week rolling correlation, uh, with the uh, WTI crude versus CAP slash USD, that means this is taking as one Canada equals how many USD the reverse, you still have a very strong correlation at 0 0.82. So uh, what if uh, we are saying over here is that if WTI prices go to much high, much up, much up higher, 
uh, Canada dollar could remain uh, firm against the USD going forward in this quarter, given its strong correlation that it has. All right, so what it means that dollar strength may be limited on against the CAD as well. So all in all, what we could see over here, it still has a mixed element. Uh, RSI still capping below a key resistance at 60%. So we still maintain that uh, neutrality stands on dollar cap for this quarter between uh, 130.20 and 12060 on the dollar Canada dollar over here. So now, uh, very quickly, commodities. So if we go to commodities over here, we will start to see uh, this is a last year performance. All, double, all very strong gains, uh, strong gains in the commodity prices across the board from uh, crude oil, uh, aluminium, copper. So with the exception of precious metal, gold and silver, which is actually the nuggets of last year, gold uh, recorded a, a loss of negative 3%, silver negative 11%. So agriculture will start to see very strong gain as well. So what's in store for WTI crude? So previously WTI crude, right, we have a key support at 5725 looking for a push up towards 87 and then after 103.90. So, but what we have over here is uh, still a very strong push, a very strong uh, monthly candle that, that we see so far this quarter or this month itself. So what we will do over here is that we will tighten the long-term pivotal support to 61.50 over here, which is actually the, the you could see a very, a very key congestion area where prices hit, rebound, hit, rebound and reverse up again. Now. So 61.50 is the key long-term pivotal support that I have this quarter. We tighten it. Monthly RSI is still pretty bullish, holding above the 53% key corresponding resistance. Key corresponding support level hasn't even uh, go into the overbought area yet. So we're still looking for a push up towards 95.50 before another uh, leg up towards potentially 103.90 slash 110 level. So this is the key major resistance up that, that, that that the price oil prices that was actually a uh, hit at the ceiling before the last dramatic collapse to shape in 2013 to 2015. So we're still expecting a, a bullish a potential bullish up up leg as uh, towards 91.50 first. A weekly close above 91.50 should take us potentially towards 103.90 slash 1110 for oil prices as long as 61.50 tighten key long term period of support holds for oil. Then now for gold, so gold previously, right, due to the mixed elements that we have, we were neutral between 1965 and 1670 40. So that was the last quarter outlook. But what's interesting over here is that uh, 1670 40 going to host. And what's interesting is that gold recently in the last four weeks or so staged this bullish breakout from this descending trend line resistance that I draw from the current all time high at August 2020. It did a, a dramatic bullish breakout. And very clearly, what we could see is the RSI did a, uh, a corresponding bullish breakout as well. So what's indicating to us over here is that uh, momentum, uh, or as indicated by the weekly RSI, has starts to actually uh, 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 creep back into the goal. So we actually, uh, for this, we are more confident potentially for this quarter to actually turn bullish on go uh, as long as 1670-40 key long-term people support holds. Uh, looking for a push up towards 1965, a break above it should take us up towards the last all time high level, swing high area at 2075 slash 160 in the first step. All right, so that's for gold. So we're actually turning uh, bullish for gold due to a uh, momentum uh, has starts, upside momentum has starts to uh, resurface on gold. Okay, now uh, what's next for the last thing will be for the cryptocurrency. So for cryptocurrency, right, uh, we're going to be cautious uh, because uh, it's actually moving hand in hand now with the U.S. stock market. If you look at the last price reaction, but however, if a uh, U.S. market has the chance to shape that final push up, we believe that cryptocurrency could shape another final push up as well potentially. So this was last quarter outlook. Uh, Thirty thousand one hundred was the, was the key uh, support for the BTC slash USD, uh, looking for a push up towards sixty four ninety. Then there after seven 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 thousand seven thousand two eighty slash ninety thousand eight hundred. So what we have for this quarter is, hey, we actually hit that uh, key, which is uh, the first resistance, which was a swing high area of 64,900. So printed an all-time high at 69,000 in November 2020 before that 52% decline took shape. Uh. And what's interesting over here is now it's trying to shape and bounce slightly above, right above the 30,100 level that we have similar in last quarter. So definitely 30,100 is a key support that we want to maintain to maintain our last push up to for uh, BTC slash USD 
uh, to retest 64,000, uh, 64,900, and thereafter 77,280, followed by 90,800. So that's the max level. So it's also the upper boundary of this uh, ascending channel that is in place since uh, 20,000, 20 December 2018 low. All right, over here. So next for ETH, ETH previously we have 19,300 as a long-term pivotal support, looking for a push up towards 54,060. Then there after 17,600, 9,230. All right. So what's happened now is also shape that push down. All right. Uh, of negative 55% after hitting an all-time high of uh, 4865 in November 2021. So we are still not, we are still uh, pretty much unchanged. The place are using the 19,330. So it's very close up. It came very close to 19,330 on Monday. Uh, uh, that is not an attempt to actually shape this uh, bullish hammer, maybe hammer formation. So this 19,030 is indeed a key long-term pivotal support that in, in order to actually maintain this uh, potential push-up, I would say a final push-up towards 4820 slash 5460, maximum a uh, close above it should take us towards 17,600 slash 9,230, which is actually the long-term, uh, this is a confluence of people expansion level as well as the long-term upper boundary of this channel that is in place since December 2016 low. Right. And RSI now is back to a key support level as well at the 37% level. So uh, all in all, we're still looking for the BTH. Uh, so BTC and ETH are still holding above their respective uh, long-term pivotal support. So we may still see continue to see a push up, but this push up may be the final push up given a strong correlation with the US uh, stock market where we are just expecting also a final push up due to the earlier uh, bearish elements that are highlighted to your intermarket correlation as well. Okay, now, so very quickly, right, to sum up what we are the key points for Q2 2020 outlook, okay? So definitely stagflation risk has increased significantly, coupled with a tightening of liquidity condition in US. The relative strength performance of S&P over the Bloomberg Commodity Index has signaled a potential major circular topping process in the S&P. And possibly uh, a global, as well as possibly the global uh, equities as well, given the significant influence of US over the rest of the world. So uh, the potential circle peak of the S&P may be seen in uh, May 2020 before the likely uh, major correction process of uh, close to around negative 30 percent uh, slash negative 40 percent at post. So risk of limited diversification benefits from US fixed income which is treasury investment grade and high yield uh, corporate bonds, and as well as cryptocurrency. If US stock shape the expected potential major corrective decline, but uh, WTI crude oil and gold may offer diversification benefits. So recent sell off in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 have managed to store right, store at their respective key long-term pivotal support uh, of, of at, uh, this uh, 4240 and 13,900 respectively. So right now we may be in the process of shaping a final push-up. We call it the irrational and hope towards a potential fresh all-time high. All right, before the correction process unfolds. So uh, China credit impulse has started to reverse up, which may trigger a potential tactical rebound in China-related stock markets like the Hansen Index as well as China big tech stocks. So US dollar may continue to strengthen in general, but unclear against the CAD due to firmer oil prices and the declining yield spread of US 10-year Treasury over Canada 10-year government bond. So the Chinese yen, we're actually expecting a last drop towards, potential towards 62.70 slash 6.2, slash 6.2 due to this shrinking discount over the US Treasury, uh, over the, uh, the yield spread between the US Treasury and the China 10-year sovereign bond that may put a cap on yen strength in the near future. So bullish bias remains intact for WTI crude, and positive elements has emerged for the London gold. So watch the long-term pivotal support of uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum at 13,100 and 1,930 uh, for a final push-up, which is in line with the forecasted movement of the S&P 500. Okay, so uh, yes, so I finally uh, managed to come towards the end of our presentation. So I hope that I'm able to cover uh, the key points that I shared with you all. So uh, before we jump into the Q&A, uh, very quickly, this is my Twitter handle. So do give me a follow at Kelvin SC Wong. So today's recording, I will actually post it over at my Twitter handle as well by tomorrow so that you all could actually view it for, for future references. Okay, all right, over here. So uh, now I actually open the floor to, to, to actually uh, right now uh, for Q&A session. So right now, the time now is just right. It's about 
803. Okay, 803. So we have close to about maybe uh, uh, five, uh, 10 minutes or so of Q&A session. So do give me a, a shout out of uh, any question that you want to ask over here. Okay, what's your opinion on China government against the tech company? Okay, very easily. I believe that the China government against the, the, the China regulation against the tech company is more or less coming close to a tail end because whatever they can propose or impose has really been priced into the market. And do not forget over here is that uh, for this year, there's key events that's taking shape in China this year. Firstly, we have the two session, which is uh, after the China Olympics. Then thereafter, somewhere around in the Q3, this is where we have a, a key meeting where the Chinese uh, members of the CCP choose the uh, top leadership of China, where presidency is likely to actually be granted another term and perhaps president for life. So during this process, I do not believe uh, the China top policy makers will want to shape, shape the business, the corporate world, okay? Because if they really shake the corporate world again, it will trigger another very big sentiment in the Chinese economy. And do not forget over here is that the China economy has really weakened significantly uh, in the last two quarters or so. So uh, that's why the Chinese authority is being forced to actually uh, take back their deleveraging policy and introduce uh, right now we call it a targeted pro-growth policy. So at least what uh, I, I, I could foresee over here is that at least in the next uh, three months or the first half of the year, we could, uh, we potentially may not start to see further drastic, uh, we call it uh, or new, uh, we call it, uh, 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 we call it uh, very uh, decronent uh, measures that's being targeted towards a platform, a Chinese platform company. All right. Second question, can you explain why MSS rise SGD USD. So I believe that uh, we are actually looking at why MAS actually tightened their policy, right? Okay, number one, do not forget, uh, we do not have, we do not watch interest rate, uh, so we watch the, uh, you know, the 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 the, the currency. The, we call it. We watch the exchange rate, the sing dollar exchange rate, against a basket of currency. All right. So uh, right now, right right now, the I believe that our movement is actually move. Okay, previously we moved in line with the euro dollar. So I believe that Euro itself has a lesser weightage based on, based on my observation. And in fact, we the Sing dollar is moved more in line with the Yuan. So if you look at, if you plot the dollar Sing, right, dollar Sing actually didn't go up much. Okay, So in fact, dollar Sing came down quite recently, which is in line with Yen strength against the dollar. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, our authorities is actually uh, did that swift, uh, you know, last on Monday, that gradual appreciation of the Sing dollar, the Sing news look, Number one is to counter inflation, and also we also do not want to see a potential, a, a, we call it a, a, a potential, we call it, uh, if, if we lag behind too much uh, against the US, because US right now is so tightening as well, all right? So we also do not want to see, uh, we call it, uh, while we are, we are in much more slow tightening mode, but US starts to tighten much faster compared to us, uh, we also do not want to see a risk of uh, capital outflows from Singapore. So that's the reason why MAS actually uh, jump ahead or, or try to actually be in line with the expected move that we have on the US Fed. All right. So I believe that could answer that question over here. So how many rate highs for US? Okay, so that one I, I couldn't answer. Okay, based on what market expectation over here, it's actually three to four heights. Okay, three to four heights. But what's interesting over here, that is being priced into the market already. Because three to four high is being priced in the market. So unless Howell did something much more drastic, or that means he starts to hint more three to four heights in the market and starts to uh, reduce the balance sheet much faster at a faster pace. So that could actually create a negative shock to the market. So uh, in fact, uh, today's will be the Fed Federal Reserve meeting. So I do not think he will actually sh shake the market. So whenever he really give, he really, really give up test balloons. So that's how the market react in the first two weeks of the new year over here. So uh, in fact, now market starts to recover slightly right at the key uh, pivotal support level. So I do not believe that today he will use the opportunity to rock the boat and say that, hey, I want to be more hawkish, okay? 
So wherever he has been being guided, the market has been guided. And do not forget over here is that uh, inflation expectation, five year and the 10 year break even rate has started to turn down slightly since the start of this year. So the guidance has been in place. Uh. So what's, what's concerning over here is that what if the rate hike in the process of Fed hiking, inflation couldn't come down. It still be, remains sticky at 7%. So that could be a problem. So that could lead to an overshooting of hiking of rates. But Fed will start to realize that, hey, the more I hike over here, the rates don't come down. Why? Because inflationary pressure could, right now, could 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 be not really, uh, uh, we call it, uh, impacted, impacted by the demand side of the story, but rather on the supply side of the story, which we're talking about. Uh, global, global supply change crunch still persists. Why? Because uh, number one, uh, if you're talking about COVID, if COVID touch wood, if COVID continue to mutate into the second half of this year, and China continue to remain in their COVID zero lockdown policy due to key events that will then take shape on the local shore in China, we could start to see global supply chain uh, issues still persist, okay, into the second half of the year. If this scenario pans out, uh, why? Because China is actually a bigger, a big player now in this global supply chain jigsaw puzzle. So any lock jam in their Chinese uh, ports itself uh, and factory starts to actually uh, uh, has less time for manufacturing due to lockdown, stringent lockdown. We may continue to see global supply or uh, we've got cost of goods production start to increase. We will start to creep into number one, corporation prices in terms of doing business, doing services. We, we eventually fit into our consumer price. All right. So that's my concern, right? Okay, any opinion whether the delisting of China stock for US stock is about to take place? Well, this one I can't answer because I'm not a, a politician. So, but for what I could see over here is it all depending on the situation. All right. So, uh, right now, it all depends on the US administration, what what place do they have at hand? Okay. So, I believe that uh, with US midterm election coming, the key thing in, in, in Biden administration over here is a more localized policy rather than international relationship. So I believe that Biden will be more focusing on how to reduce uh, US inflationary rate and how to actually kickstart the US economy. Um, we could say artificially or you know for the sake of doing something to actually for, allow the Democrats to actually uh, maintain their power during the midterm election in the Senate as well as the House, House of uh, the House, the House is to find ways to actually iron out the issue in the two trillion worth of this Build Back uh, Better Plan, which is the U.S. Uh, Biden administration envision that is now in lockjam uh, that's being ding dong between the House and Senate. So I believe that uh, this, 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 this two internal uh, policies or internal mandate will likely uh, be in the mind of uh, the US administration uh, rather than international relationship. So uh, I don't think uh, there's a risk, the, the risk of a delisting to take shape, maybe this year may not be so high, yeah, but the risk is still there down the road, uh, it's still a risk. Uh, if, very similar that if uh, the correction takes shape. Uh, so right now, very simple. If the correction starts to take shape in the third quarter, uh, second half of this year, it means that the major correction in the stock market takes shape. So doing major correction stock market like globally, which I shared with you all earlier on, sentiment will be very bad from, for, for everyone, for corporation, for individuals, for global governments. So doing bad sentiment, right, global, people will tend to find fault in one another. All right. So they like to find fault, hey, what causes this to happen? So that, if that could happen, right, uh, US may start to push the blame on China. So they may start to say, hey, China, you are, the, you are the one that causes this inflationary problem. Why? Because you refuse to open up your economy due to COVID, your COVID zero strategy, which causes the global supply chain crunch. So you are to blame. So I got to find some ways to punish you. Okay, so if that really to take shape, right, uh, that potential delisting should, should process to happen. So this gives me a scenario over here is that what we could see right now, right, China stocks or big tech stocks is only tactical rebound. I do not expect them to shape all time high. That means US market can share, share all time high. So after that peak of the S&P 490 is being seen, potentially all global stock market should may shape that uh, drastic 30 to 40% corrective decline. And one of the scenarios that lead to it is what I call an increase in tension between US and China. All right. Do you think China tech company will recover to pre-growth rate? Uh, no, unfortunately no, because at the end of the day, I still see this as a technical rebound because uh, if that global, uh, that, that US uh, corrective, that the US stock market major correction takes place in around 
May 2022, due to the analysis I share with you all, it will likely impact the rest of the world. So I do not see that uh, very hard for, for us, for me to actually expect China big tech stock doing all time high, whilst the rest of the world is actually shipping that uh, dramatic potential 30 to 40% correction triggered by the US stock market. Okay, so that, that's, that, that's not my baseline view here. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, as I explained earlier, uh, number one, uh, major caution take shape, China and Hong Kong market, they will not be able to escape. Why? Because uh, China, firstly, they do not have a strong influence in the international field yet. And do not forget, uh, China top policymakers makers have been stated, this round of monetary easing, be it monetary and physical, physical policy easing, is not going to be uh, something that happened in four years ago, in 2016 and in 2008 during the, the, the great during the great Lehman Brothers crisis where China actually opened the liquidity tap tremendously. So right now, right, this 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 pro pro growth policy in China is more targeted. So the China top policy, top policy maker has made clear that it's targeted is to elevate the current property stress in the market rather than hoping to jumpstart an acceleration of growth, China growth. All right, so that's why I, I don't think uh, uh, China uh, top policymaker will do a very, very, what I call massive liquidity pumping into their system. So uh, to me, I still view that as a tactical rebound in Hong Kong and China stock market rather than the birth of a long-term circular uh, bullish run. So what positive you may see over here is that given China and China stock market, or Hong Kong market, about Hong Kong, Hong Kong stock market and the Hang Seng Tech Index has fallen so much. So if that US induced 30 to 40 percent correction took shape, perhaps maybe due to the the earlier sell off of this uh, the earlier what I call uh, engineered sell off of the Hong Kong market and the Hong, Hang Kong and Hang Seng and Hang Seng Tech Index as triggered by the what I call targeted uh, China top policy makers, you know, their, their whatever, whatever uh, draconian measures, or I call this, this engineered uh, engine measures, uh, these stocks, this China big tech stock or even Hansen index, uh, perhaps they may not fall below the December low. That means we're talking about Hansen index holding at the 23,000 level and Hansen tech index holding that December low level. So that's the most positive uh, outcome that I, could, uh, that I could see, all right, potentially, yeah. All right. So I hope that uh, I'm able to answer most of the questions. So uh, anyone has other further questions? Because uh, we reached the 10 minute mark already. Any further questions to go before we wrap it up? All right. So uh, thank you. So Malaysia, thank you very much for your time. So I do have a great pleasant evening ahead. And before we go, I wish you all a prosperity, abundance and good health in the year of the Tiger. So uh, do stay safe and I see you again hopefully in person if we're able to conduct a seminar soon and if not we'll be doing the uh, webinar again as usual for the coming months. So uh, have a great evening and I see you all next soon. Thank you.